So hi everyone, both on site and online. Welcome to our workshop titled Ekitekiti, Closing the Gap with Digital Health Literacy. And my name is Connie. I'm a 22-year-old biomedical engineering student and also a United Nations International Telecommunication Union Generation Connect Youth Envoy with a passion for internet governance. So in the next 85 minutes, we'll be exploring how digital technologies have transformed healthcare, especially during the pandemic. However, despite progress, digital health has not necessarily improved health equity. Low digital health literacy and the digital divide are still persisting, in turn creating disparities in access to care. So in this session, we will discuss strategies to enhance digital health literacy and identify measures to promote equitable digital health access. Our goal is to find innovative policy solutions that bridge the digital divide and ensure that digital health truly advances healthcare outcomes for all. Thank you all for joining us on this important journey and let's get started. We have three key policy questions that will guide our discussion today. How can comprehensive frameworks and assessment tools be developed to capture and assess different dimensions of digital health literacy, ensuring holistic understanding of individuals' abilities in navigating digital health information and services? What strategies towards health equity can be adopted to ensure digital health literacy programs effectively address unique needs and challenges faced by marginalized communities, promote inclusivity and equitable access to digital health resources? And also how can partnerships between key stakeholders, including healthcare providers, educational institutions, technolo technology companies, and governments be leveraged to enhance digital health literacy skills, foster collaboration and knowledge sharing to advance health equity. Our panelists will be addressing these issues today. So if you would like to ask a question towards the panel, we will have a Q&A session at the end for on-site participants. And online participants may use the Zoom chat to type and send in your questions. And my online moderator, Valerie, will be helping me with them. So without further ado, to kick off our discussion, I would like to introduce our esteemed panelists who will share their insights on these matters. First, joining us online, we have Ms. Geraldine Miller, an innovation leader driving change in healthcare and life sciences through AI. She is a senior director at Microsoft in Product Incubations, Microsoft Health and Life Sciences Cloud, Data and AI. And she's also the co-founder and head of AI for Health, which is Microsoft AI for Good Research Lab. And then we have Professor Rahendra Gupta joining us on site here today, a leading public policy expert with vast experience in policy making. And he's been involved in major global initiatives on digital health and holds several key positions in the digital health arena. He's also the founder and behind many pathbreaking initiatives like his Project Create and or organizations working for digital health. And next we have Ms. Debbie Rogers joining us on site as well. She's an experienced leader in the design and management of national digital mobile health programs and the CEO of Reach Digital Health, aiming to harness existing technologies to improve healthcare and create societal impact. And last but definitely not least, we have Ms. Jari Carr joining us online. She's an internet governance scholar, youth activist, and AI advocate. And she's also a digital youth envoy for the ITU like me, and a global shaper with the World Economic Forum, with her work centering on responsible AI and data science for social good. Now let's begin section one of today's workshop on low digital health literacy and strategies. And I would like Ms. Geraldine to take the floor first. So what research and development initiatives, for example, including the creation of comprehensive frameworks and assessment tools, is Microsoft pursuing to address the multifaceted challenges of low digital health literacy? And additionally, can you highlight your thoughts and innovative strategies and partnerships that Microsoft is employing or supporting to enhance digital health literacy among marginalized populations with a focus on inclusivity and equitable access, especially in low income and rural areas? Ms. Geraldine, over to you. Yeah, great, thanks. And thank you for inviting me uh, today to participate in this. Um, so the lens I'm gonna take from this is really based on uh, something that is known as social determinants of health. Um, so I want to start by defining insanity checking that uh, social determinant of health is a non-medical factor that influences health outcomes. Um, so this is the conditions that people are born, uh, work, and live in, uh, and the wider set of forces that shape conditions of our daily lives. 
right? So this includes things like economic policy and development agendas, social norms, social policies, racism, even climate change and political systems. And this affects about, uh, from research, uh, we know that this is about 30 to 55% of health outcomes um, are actually really dependent on social determinants of health. So when you wanna think about health equity and digital literacy, it's really important to, for two things. First, to understand the problem based on data. And I'll share a little bit about what Microsoft Research is doing in that area. And the second is to open your mind and have a willingness to address the underlying often systemic problems that affect, that affect health outcomes. And that includes uh, social determinants of health. Um, so, so Microsoft has some things that we're doing to understand the problem with data, including um, the, the Microsoft AI for Good team has built something that we call a health equity dashboard um, th that is essentially a Power BI dashboard that takes a number of public data sets and allows um, one to look at them um, from a geography perspective, slice and dice the data by rural, uh, suburban and urban populations, and then also examine different health outcomes. Um, including things like life expectancy. So that's the first thing, right? Is really being able to understand and visualize the problem itself. Um, so I invite you to, um, to actually uh, have a look at that uh, information. Um, there's a number of other things that from a Microsoft perspective we're doing to look at um, on the social determinants of health side. So I'll, I'll point, for example, to some of the work we're doing on climate change. Um, we announced a climate change research initiative that we call MCRI, which is really a multidisciplinary research initiative um, that is focusing on things like carbon accounting, carbon removal, and environmental resilience. Um, we also have our Microsoft AI for Good uh, research lab and their humanitarian action program. Um, we have a, they have, for example, worked with a group called Humanitarian Open Street Map Team or HOT, uh, which partnered with Bing Maps to map areas vulnerable to natural disaster and poverty. So that's an example of some of the work out of the research lab and the humanitarian action program coming together to help um, give relief teams information to respond better after disasters. Um, there's also a lot of work that we have happening from a Microsoft perspective um, that ties more directly to economic development um, and, and digital skilling. Uh, so we have some work out of LinkedIn, uh, something called the Economic Graph, which uh, based which is a um, a perspective or a view based on data of more than 950 million professionals and 50 million companies. Um, LinkedIn, which is a Microsoft company, um, also has a data for impact program. And this program um, makes a, this type of professional data available to partner, uh, partner entities, including uh, entities um, like the World Bank Group, the European Bank and others. Uh, so it's data on more than 180 countries and regions, and this is at no cost to the partner organizations. Um, an example of the impact of this type of, of data, this uh, data for impact information was able to um, advise and inform a $1.7 billion World Bank strategy uh, for the country of Argentina. And then there's also the Microsoft Learn program. Uh, which is a free online learning platform enabling students and job seekers to expand their skills. So role-based learning for things like AI engineers, data scientists, and software developers, hundreds of learning paths and thousands of modules uh, localized in 23 different languages. So summer, in summarizing, I just want to say that um, we look at this as from a holistic, broad perspective um, as digital health literacy and digital skills as part of um, the social determinants of health and the work that we're doing to support those. Thank you very much, Ms. Ms. Miller. And now moving on to Ms. Debbie. As an experienced leader in the design and management of national M health programs and the CEO of Reach Digital Health, can you share your thoughts on digital health literacy, digital divide and health equity, effective strategies for enhancing digital health literacy among marginalized populations, particularly in resource restrained um, resource constraint settings, and additionally, how can partnerships between nonprofit organizations like REACH and private sector mobile operators be strengthened to promote digital health literacy among women and marginalized communities, addressing gender-based barriers and limited resources while contributing to bridging the digital divide? Thanks very much. Um, so 
I think the first thing just to talk about is a little bit of the context. So we work primarily in Africa. Um, to give you an idea around um, inequality in health in sub-Saharan Africa, we have 10% of the world's population, 24% of the disease burden, and only 3% of the health workers. Um, and so we really are, do have the odds stacked against us in a time when we're supposed to be going towards universal health care, um, which quite honestly is a pipe dream if you look at where things are at the moment. While we've made some progress um, in addressing maternal and child health and uh, addressing disease, infectious diseases such as HIV, we are getting an increased burden when it comes to non-communicable diseases. So the, the, the burden is just increasing, not decreasing. Um, and so really, this if we follow the same patterns over and over again, and we keep just training more and more health workers and not addressing the systemic issues or relieving the burden from the health system, then there's absolutely no way that we're going to be able to improve these stats. We sh we're going to go backwards and not forwards. Um, and so I think I'm... I'm fairly optimistic, actually, because I think, I think that digital, and particularly mobile, um, has the opportunity to really address some of these issues in a way that many other interventions don't. Um, Reach Digital Health was founded in 2007 with the idea that the massive increase in access to mobile technology in Africa, at the time, um, more people in Africa had access uh, percentage-wise to mobile technology than in the so-called global north or western countries, was a way for us to leapfrog some of the challenges that we've had um, in the global south and to actually address some of these issues. And we really have been able to see that. We have been able to see, we've been able to see how the access to information and services through a small device that's in the palm of many people's hands has been able to improve health, um, both from a personal behavior change perspective, but also health systems as a whole. Um, and so what we primarily focus on is using really, really low tech, but highly scalable technology. So things like SMS, WhatsApp, these are the things that everybody uses every day to communicate to their family and friends, and we use that to empower them in their health, help them to um, practice healthy behaviors, to stop unhealthy behaviors, and to access the right services at the right time. And with the fairly ubiquitous nature of mobile technology in, in Africa, um, we've been able to reach people at a massive scale. So for example, we have a maternal health program with the Department of Health in South Africa. It's been running since 2014. We've reached 4.5 million mothers on that platform. But that represents about 60% of the mothers who have given birth in the public health system over the last eight years, which percentage-wise is huge. Um, and we've been able to see that this has had impacts such as improved uptake of breastfeeding, um, improved uptake of family planning, um, and really has seen uh, not just an individual change, but a more systemic change with the ability to understand what is the quality of care on a national scale for the Department of Health in South Africa. And so we really do believe that if you harness the power of the simplest technology, if you design for scale with scale in mind, if you design with um, understanding the context, then you can actually use digital to be able to uh, increase health literacy. Um, and so it's not all doom and gloom. It's not just about um, you know, the fact that digital is always excluding other people. It can be an enabler, but only, of course, if we consider the wider context and we don't go blindly into things um, and, and uh, ignore the fact that this could be uh, something that increases the divide. And so I think I'll talk a little bit later more about some of the strategies that can be used, but I think two things to remember is design with the human, not patient, I don't like the word patient, but in digital health we tend to use that word, um, with the human at the center of what you're trying to do, and design understanding that you are a part of a bigger system, um, and this is not something that exists by itself. And if you do those two things, not only will you be able to improve health literacy, but you'll be able to do so in a way um, that doesn't widen the divide that many technologies already, um, already put in place. 
Thank you very much, Ms. Devi. Now moving on to Professor Gupta. With your extensive experience in policy development, digital health education, and founding the world's first digital health university, can you share your thoughts and offer key policy recommendations that governments and international organizations should prioritize to comprehensively enhance digital health literacy, especially amongst marginalized populations. Additionally, can you share insights into successful and scalable educational strategies and approaches that have effectively improved digital health literacy with a focus on adapting these methods globally to meet healthcare skilling needs for digital health? Thanks, Connie. Firstly, I congratulate you for picking up this very important topic. And secondly, I'm a little worried for such a long question because after 5 p.m. almost like I'm half asleep. There's been engaging uh, sessions throughout the day, but yes, it's a very important topic. It keeps me awake, but pardon me for my incoherence. But let me give you a little backdrop of why this topic is important. Uh, there is an international society called International Society of Telemedicine and eHealth. It's been around for a quarter of a century and has memberships in 117 countries. So way back in 2018, I said that digital health has two opportunities and two challenges, but the two challenges are like, we have reached a stage of technical maturity. Give me a challenge, I'll give you 100 solutions. But where we lack is organizational maturity. People are not trained enough to leverage technology that's available. So I said, let's look at capacity building. I think the issue that you have brought up. So 2019, they formed the capacity building working group, which I chair, and post that we have done two papers on capacity building. You know, One is listing the kind of people we need to train across digital health. And second, we have done a deep dive. We released that in partnership with World Health Organization. So there is, for those who are looking at you know, what kind of capacity we need, the ISFTH website has a list, two papers written on this topic. And then 2019, WHO set up their capacity building department, which is a very recent thing. So I think um, there is a lot of focus and now coming back to what my experience was. So having pushed various organizations to do that, but I still realized we were just doing policy papers and you know, policies take time to translate. I mean, people like Debbie would need people to help her, you know, in technology. I mean, a policy paper can't help her. She needs people trained in digital health. So in 2019, I set up the Digital Health Academy, uh, which now uh, is now the Academy of Digital Health Sciences. We have started a course for doctors and for people in healthcare. It's a global course, fully online, as digital course should be. Uh, but to your point, that also would not solve my biggest overall challenge. I am training doctors, you know, it is so shocking, and I'll put a context to that, that we had a half-page advertisement in a leading newspaper in India. A very a senior doctor called me and asked, Rajan, what's digital health? So. I was shocked that even doctors need to be first apprised that what does word digital health mean. I'll give you another example. There's a company that works exclusively in data domain. So I called the founder who's a doctor and asked, do you do digital health? He said, no Raj, we don't do digital health. I said, do you use data? He said, we only use data. So I said, you only do digital health. So the challenge is first people should know the definition of digital health. That is the level we have to get in and which is needed across the ecosystem. So right from the bureaucracies and the ministers in the ministries of health, they need to understand what is digital health because they come for a fixed tenure or they get transferred. If that level they are sensitized, then the things flow down the line because government makes policies which get implemented as programs. So that's one level of competencies that I have told WHO to look at because my experience in WHO meetings is that Bureaucrats, bureaucrats come, they spend two, three days in Geneva or New York, and then they go back and forget it. So there has to be a course for policymakers at the highest level, which probably WHO or any organization could do. The second level is what we need to do is the courses for doctors and health professionals. And third and the most important, which we are launching in next two months, is frontline health workers. But understand the challenge that frontline health workers are either doing voluntary service, like you have the ASHA workers in India, which is a million workers. They are our first line or first responders. Don't expect them to pay you $1,000 or $100. So we had to actually innovate and convince one of the Institute of National Importance that we need to bring out $1 trainings. So we should train people for as low as $1. 
and uh, this we are doing globally. So frontline health workers, if I'm able to train, I think I would have addressed the biggest challenge for healthcare. Now one of the government's agency has approached us to work with us. So as such, on the capacity building, I think governments just focus on the program minus capacity building, which is a serious lapse. And I think this is across the board. I think Debbie would agree on that, is that we are very focused on saying maternal health, mobile application, child health, mobile application, rural health, telemedicine, but who will do it? We don't know. But people who are going to use don't even know how to use a mobile phone. They do not know how to log in on the account. So we need basic training. And I think this is what uh, private organizations, not-for-profits, and then government step in very late, let me tell you that. So they are not the ones who would initiate. So once you go with the program, talk to them, they will partner. So uh, as a policy, uh, I'm glad, Connie, that you have put a session on this, something that our digital health um, dynamic coalition should have done, but they only allow one session for a dynamic coalition. So we had our session, which we are doing tomorrow, but now that you have taken it up, it puts the spotlight on this important topic. Uh, at ISFTH, there are policy papers. They, need, they have been given to WHO. WHO set up the capacity building department, but honestly, nothing much has moved between 19 and 23, four years. Uh, we're still to look at, and they're still forming a committee. So I think it's mostly going to be uh, the civil society organizations and private sector that will take the lead. On policy side, I have not seen documents that talk about it so far, so we will have to wait for a normative guidance from WHO, which will be still, I think, a few years away. It takes time to build a document in WHO. Uh, how this will happen fast is like this. Like in India, we have a digital health mission, which has rolled out 460 million health IDs. Uh, in this year, we will roll out 1 billion health IDs. Our health consultations, teleconsultations have crossed 120 million. So I think that is the first point. So I'm inverting the process from pol policy to let's first have implementation. So when the government rolls out at such level and scale, automatically you will start feeling the need of trained people in this. So I think this is one thing, but more than structured courses, it'll be more of continuous upskilling that everyone will need to do because technology is also changing. Till last year, no one talked about generative AI. Now people have started talking about generative AI. So I think uh, we need to keep that training as fluid and make it more as a continuous upskilling program for people across healthcare. Uh, we are not waiting for government policies. We are rolling out as Digital Academy of Digital Health Sciences, and these are global programs. Uh, we are making it really affordable as $1 trainings for frontline health workers. For doctors and for the industry, it's the postgraduate program. And we will announce undergraduate programs as well, because I think this is where we need to build capacity. So for now, I think policy interventions will happen. I think overall, a part of the health policy, everyone should put capacity building. And digital health is now an integral part of health. So digital upskilling is required for digital scaling. So I think this is something that governments have to look at. And WHO has to take a frontal role. So I would say more, more to WHO. And organizations like the one that Debbie runs, organizations like the ones that well, I run with my team. And more importantly, there are two people sitting in this room, Priya and Saptashi, they run Patients Union, International Patients Union. Even if you train doctors, industry, and the frontline health workers, if patients are not trained, who will use digital? Well, at the end of the day, they have to open an app, use it. They need to know what's privacy, what's security. So it's onus on people like them, you know, to go and train patients for how to use digital technology. So it's a multi-dimensional topic. And I'm happy that there's a session dedicated to this. Unless we address this in a complete ecosystem perspective, we are not done justice to this topic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Gupta. And now to Jari. As someone with expertise in responsible AI, digital rights, and a passion for the intersection of technology and society, how can policymakers craft regulations to ensure the responsible development and deployment of digital health technologies, especially for marginalized communities? And also, what role do you see for youth-led initiatives in, in enhancing digital health literacy, bridging the digital divide, and engaging with policymakers to drive policies that support equitable access to digital health resources? Over to you. Hello, everyone, dear organizers, participants, and guests. Um, thank you very much, Connie, for the organization, and a, a thank you for inviting me. Well, so in a world where technology and healthcare um, 
are more intertwined than ever. The responsible de development and deployment of digital health technologies are of paramount importance. This is especially true when considering marginalized communities where equitable access to healthcare is not just a goal, but a moral imperative. So in this case, I would like to mention the responsible research and innovation framework as one of the guiding philosophies that serve as a roadmap for navigating the intricate terrain of AI in healthcare. At its core, RRI is a commitment to harmonizing technological process with ethical principles. It places a premium on transparency and accountability, recognizing them as pivotal elements in the responsible development and deployment of AI technologies. In the realm of healthcare AI, RRI advocates for policies that do not only uphold digital rights, safeguarding privacy and security, but also establishing mechanisms to hold AI systems answerable for their decisions. It is a holistic approach that seeks to ensure that benefits of innovation are realized without compromising ethical standards or jeopardizing individual rights. So who should be involved in a process of responsible research and innovation? Societal actors and innovators, scientists, scientists, business partners, research funders and policymakers, all stakeholders involved in research and innovation uh, practice, funders, researchers, stakeholders and the public, large community of people, early stages of r &I processes and the process as a whole. And when? Through the entire innovation's life cycle. And to do what? To do what? So uh, it is important to anticipate risks and benefits, to reflect on prevailing conceptions, values, and beliefs, to engage stakeholders and members of the wider public, uh, to respond uh, the stakeholders' uh, public values and also the changing circumstances that are present in these kind of processes, to describe and analyze potential impacts, uh, reflecting on underlying purposes, motivations, um, uncertainties, risks, assumptions and questions and the a huge amount of dilemmas that could also emerge in this kind of circumstances and open to reflections um, and to have a collective deliberation and a process of reflex reflexi reflexivity um, and to integrate measures throughout the whole innovation process. So these are um, also in which ways should we do this, working together, becoming mutually responsive to each other, and of course in an open, inclusive, and in a timely um, matter. And to what ends, what, what this framework proposes is that um, it's allowing appropriate embedding of scientific and technological advances in society to better align the processes and outcomes with values, needs, and expectations of society to take care of the future, to ensure desirable and acceptable research outcomes, um, solve a set of moral problems, and um, will also protect the environment and consider impacts on social and economic dimensions, also uh, promote creativity and opportunities for science and innovation that are socially desirable and are taking the public interest, and how these can be applied specifically in a context of healthcare, of healthcare technologies. For example, there, is, uh, there are a academic projects and also societal projects. One example of an academic project is one uh, from the Technical University of Munich in which I am now um, yeah, studying. Um, well, uh, we have a project that's, um, that's an AI-driven innovation, including a robotic arm of exoprosthesis exoprothesis and an advanced version of bimanual mobile service robot. So to ensure the responsible and ethical integration of these technologies into broader healthcare applications, the developers from the Machine Intelligence Institute have collaborated with the Institute of History and Ethics of Medicine, as well as the Munich Center for Technology and Society. And these teams are employing embedded ethics, incorporating ethics, ethicists, social scientists, and legal experts into the development processes. So they have initial onboarding uh, workshops where these experts have become integral members of the development team. Uh, they have been actively participating in regular virtual meetings to discuss technological advancements, algorithmic deploy development and product design collaboratively and interdisciplinary. And when ethical challenges are raised, 
they are addressed as part of the regular development process leading to adjustments in product design. An example involves the planning of model flats for a smart city where initial designs focus on open play lay layouts. Embedded ethics is highlighted in this case, potential challenges for um, elderly population and accustomed to such arrangements, promoting a reconsideration of the layout. Also taking into consideration that these kind of projects um, in, in this specific case was, uh, had a target population of the elderly population. So this is why it is very important to look at this target population and uh, actually see if they are prepared and if they could uh, be adapted to these kind of technologies. Um, so insights from this discussion influence the design process, emphasizing the importance of directly seeking future in a, inhabitant perspectives in layout planning. And simultaneously, the project also involves interviews with various stakeholders, including developers, programmers, healthcare providers, and patients. Um, well, workshops, participant observations of development work, and collaborative, re collaborative reflection and case studies contribute also to active ethical consideration. And um, well, the project is also aiming to develop a toolbox to facilitate the implementation of embedded ethics ethics in diverse settings in the future. But there are also some several unresolved issues that remain and that are also like with the um, cultural setting and with the um, corporate um, and organizational structures. Um, because even in research uh, setting funded by public resources, the development of AI is predominantly situated in a fiercely com competitive landscape prioritization with prioritization of efficiency, speed, and also profit. Um, so, um, and also in the, in the case of health, so ethical considerations might be normally um, um, isolated or like uh, are normally like not so taken into in importance when they directly clash with profit-driven motives. So they, taking ethical concerns seriously often creates a tension with industry objectives and faces the risk of being assimilated into broader corporate, corporate commitments to concepts like um, technological solutionism, market fund, uh, fundamentalism, that at the end um, prevents ethicists to actually do their work and to do a responsible um, healthcare technology. Um, normally, embedded ethicists may find themselves working within contexts that are characterized by pronounced power imbalances, particularly those of a financial nature. And it is probable that some form of enforcement measure, measures will become very necessary in such environments. So not just for the development of the technical aspects, but also like for the work of the persons that are working on the responsible uh, development and deployment so that maybe regulatory framework certification processes or even voluntary initiatives into the organization can uh, make an awareness of these kind of, of issues that are arising in, this, in these situations. And well, okay, I also needed to talk about youth-led um, initiatives, right? Uh, if I still have time, okay. So, um, well, there are also like a lot of um, ways in which youth-led um, initiatives and also marginalized community um, could also um, engage with responsible research and innovation. So for example, um, youth-led initiatives could um, connect or could try to, to participate in events such as this one, but also like try to um, that universities or centers of education could inspire the youth so that they can also learn about telemedicine, how can they develop telemedicine initiatives in countries um, and also in special rural areas as, as, the, as the professor was mentioning about in India that these kind of uh, populations don't have the same access. Also, for example, community-based participatory research projects that are involved in communities uh, in their research process, ensuring that interventions are culturally sensitive and address the specific needs of the population 
um, also digital health literary, pro literary programs. And um, also like innovation challenges could be um, motivated between students and youth so that they can also engage. And I also consider the mentorship that these uh, students or youth can also gain from experienced people is also very um, important because they need a guidance and also like uh, foundations and also examples of how can they um, yeah, develop their ideas. So thank you. Thank you very much, Jerry. So while low digital health literacy is a challenge for all populations, it's also particularly harmful for marginalized communities. So in this section, we'll discuss strategies for addressing health equity and the digital divide in the context of digital health. So let's start this off with Ms. Geraldine again. So in light of the session's focus on health equity and the digital divide, could you share your thoughts and elaborate on specific policy measures and initiatives that Microsoft is advocating for or actively participating in to bridge the digital divide and promote equitable digital health access? And also how is Microsoft addressing barriers faced by diverse populations and how are these efforts contributing to advancing health equity? Over to you. Yeah, thank you very much for, uh, for the question. Um, so I, I want to um, respond to, in this context, to some of the comments that Dr. Gupta and, 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 and Ms. Carr mentioned and, and really shine a light on um, the concept of artificial intelligence, uh, generative AI, and uh, what we at Microsoft call responsible AI as an example of policy. Um, so one of my favorite quotes in this area is a quote by um, our chief legal officer and president Brad Smith. And I'm going to paraphrase a quote I don't have exactly, but Brad has a quote that basically um, says that when you bring a technology into the world and your technology changes the world, you bear a responsibility as a person that created that, that technology to help address the world that the technology helps create. And so from a Microsoft perspective, we look at this um, under the lens of something that we call responsible AI. Our responsible, uh, responsible AI initiatives date back far before uh, the birth of chat GPT and generative AI and large uh, foundation models and large language models, um, really back to about 2018, 2019. Um, and we have um, a set of principles that, that we've established um, that are around how you design solutions that are worthy of people's trust. Um, so th this is our, these are our principles, what we call our responsible AI principles. Um, many, there are many pe people who have uh, different principles around responsible AI. I'll share with you ours. I would just offer that um, it's something worthy of thought. And, and very often when I work with, you know, academic medical centers or healthcare providers who are starting to use AI or build and deploy um, AI models, I also... Um, offer to them, hey, you should have a position on responsible AI, right? Do your thought work, do your homework. You should have something that is consistent with your own values, your own entity's values. And But but going back to, from a Microsoft perspective, what we believe those principles are, um, the principles are really based on fairness. So treating all stakeholders equ equitably and not uh, making sure that the models themselves don't um, reinforce any undesirable stereotypes or biases. Transparency, so this is all about AI systems and their outputs being understandable to relevant stakeholders. And relevant stakeholders in the context of healthcare means not, on, not only um, patients who may be um, receiving the, uh, the output of this, but also clinicians who may be using these as decision support tools or to do some type of prediction. Um, accountability, and uh, so people who design and deploy AI systems have to be accountable for how the systems operate. And I'm gonna do a click down on accountability in a second. Um, reliability, so systems should be designed to perform safely, even in the worst case scenarios. Uh, privacy and security, of course, that goes, um, those are underpinnings behind any technology and, and AI systems as well should protect data from misuse and ensure privacy rights. And then inclusion, and this is all about designing systems that empower everyone regardless of ability and engaging people uh, for in the feedback channel and in the, in the creation of these tools. Um, and there are some things uh, I will drill down on a little bit on the inclusion front as well. 
So when you, an example, as I mentioned of the accountability, I'd like to share some things that are, uh, you know, President Brad Smith was um, offering when he testified before this, uh, the U.S. Senate Ju uh, Judiciary Subcommittee. This was a uh, uh, back in the beginning of September, around September 12th, um, on a hearing entitled The Oversight of AI uh, Legislating and Artificial Intelligence. Um, so Brad highlighted a, a few areas uh, that he is suggesting help shape and drive uh, policy. One is really about accountability in uh, AI development and deployment. Uh, things like ensuring that the products are safe before they're offered to the public. Building systems that put security first earning trust. So this is things like provenance technology and watermarks so people know when they're looking at the output of an AI system. Um, disclosure of model limitations, including effects on fairness and bias. Um, and then also um, really uh, channeling uh, uh, research energy and funding into things that are looking at societal risk associated with AI. Um, he also suggested that we need something called, you know, what he termed safety breaks for AI that manages any type of critical infrastructure or critical scenarios, including health. Um, and, you know, when you think today we have uh, collision avoidance systems in airlines, we have circuit breakers in buildings that help prevent uh, a fire due to, for example, power surges, right? AI systems should have safety breaks as well. So this involves in uh, classifying systems so you know which ones are high risk, requiring these safety breaks, testing and monitoring to make sure that the human always remains in control, and then licensing infrastructure for the deployment of critical systems. Um, and then um, from a policy perspective, ensuring that the regulatory framework actually maps to how these systems are designed so that the two flow together and work together. So that's an example of the policy in action uh, side of, the, of things. And from a Microsoft perspective, we put our responsible AI principles that I mentioned um, into action through our commitments at a, at a policy level. Our voluntary alignment, for example, here in the U.S. out of some of the things coming out of the White House. So voluntary alignment with commi commitments around safety, security, and, and trustworthiness of AI. Um, and on one last point, I did want to go back to um, the responsible AI principle and talk about inclusion. Um, and so we're doing some work from a Microsoft perspective in, in the health AI team that um, I am a a product manager on to really look at how um, when we have data that guides models in either this is either custom AI models or when we're grounding large foundation models or large language models with data, how do we make sure that we understand the, the distribution and makeup of that data to ensure, uh, to ensure that their bias doesn't creep in from the data perspective? And we're also doing work, for example, on the deployment of models. How do you understand um, if models are performing as they intended? How do you model, monitor for things, something called model drift? So when models start uh, to perform in a manner that isn't how you think, right? When the accuracy starts to decline, and then what, what do you do when the models uh, don't uh, perform that way? And this last part, the model monitoring and drift is, is some of the things that we have happening out of our research organization. So thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Geraldine. So now I want to move back to Ms. Debbie. Drawing from your experience in developing the digital strategy for a major telco in South Africa, how can telecommunication companies play a more significant role in advancing health equity and bridging the digital divide through innovative approaches and digital solutions? And also what lessons can be learned from your work in South Africa that can be applied globally to improve digital health access? Thanks. Um, I think um, one of the most interesting examples of how mobile network operators have um, really had a big impact on de de decreasing any inequities around health is the Facebook Free Basics model. Um, you may not know what that was, but fa uh, Facebook um, basically put together simple information through what was looked like a, a little Moby site. Um, and this was essential information that they felt everybody should, should have access to. And they worked with mobile network operators to zero rate access to only that portion of Facebook, just that portion, not to everything, but just that portion. 
Um, and they were able to show that by providing essential information that is free to access, they were able to improve people's um, literacy and, so, and, and use of data. So they then went on to, to use more data and to use the internet more often and therefore become more valuable customers to the MNOs. So by doing something like providing free access to essential information, there was also a um, an uh, increase in profit for the, for the mobile network operators. Um, and I think that's a really interesting uh, model to look at. Um, I think very often we forget that um, there it's just as important for mobile network operators to be reaching as many people as possible as it is for those of us who are trying to improve health through th something like digital health. And so if there are aligned priorities, then there are very good ways that you can work together. One of the ways that we've worked with mobile network operators in South Africa has been to reduce the cost of sending uh, messages out to uh, to citizens of the, of the country. Um, and that's been done not in a way that prohibits um, the mobile network operators from making a profit, but what it does do is it makes it completely free for the end user. So if it's completely free for the end user, you're reducing the barriers for them to be able to access this kind of information. Um, but the reduced cost is then um, something that can be um, brought, brought to the table because of the increased size of access. So the more we scale out these programs, the more we're able to uh, see economies of scale, and the more worthwhile it then becomes for uh, mobile network operators to engage with us. And so um, one of the very interesting models that's been used was to reduce churn. So if people can only access um, information, say, using a um, MTN uh, SIM card, they're less likely to switch to other SIM cards if that's if that's the case. And so, being able to align the health, uh, the the desires of a health uh, um, digital health organisation or government with those of mobile network operators is incredibly important for being able to uh, ensure that you're working towards the same goal, um, but without anyone asking for any handouts because that's not going to work. I think when it comes to um, strategies for decreasing um, inequity, I think the one that we really need to talk about more is, is about being human-centered. Um, and that doesn't just mean designing for people and occasionally having them um, attend a fo focus group. It means designing with them and ensuring that the service is actually something that they want to use, something that they love using. Make it easy and intuitive for them to use. No one starts a course on how to use Facebook before they use Facebook. Um, we shouldn't create services that need so much upskilling. We should create services that are simple and easy for people to use. You need to use appropriate language and literacy levels. Um, and this is something that the medical fraternity often forgets about um, because it is a very patriarchal society. Um, make it something that is um, easy uh, is is at least close to free for people to access. Um, we find that access to a mobile device is less of a problem than the cost of data, for example. So just because somebody has access to a device doesn't mean that they're going to be able to go and look up information because they may not have um, data on their phones. So you can work very closely um, to reduce the cost or make it zero cost, uh, and that's really going to ensure that you reduce the barrier to, to access. Um, and then, you know, you really have to try and think about the system that you're in. By creating a digital health solution, are you, are you overburdening the health system that already exists, for example, or are you reducing the burden on it? Are you creating feedback me mechanisms that mean that you can understand what the impact is that you're having on the system itself, rather than working within a, a vacuum? Are you making sure that where a digital health solution may not be accessible to somebody, there is an alternative in place that does not rely on the digital health solution? 
We can't just operate within silos. We have to think about the fact that digital health is just as much a part of health infrastructure as the physical facilities, for example. Um, until digital health is seen as just as much of, of an infrastructure, it's going to be a fun project on the side and not something that's going to have some uh, systemic change. And so it's really important for us to think about that system. And then recognizing biases, I think Geraldine mentioned this, very often the people who are creating digital health services are not the people that, they are, that are using the digital health services. So this is, goes back to why human-centered design is so important, but it's also important to understand that, that you will be introducing biases if the people who are building the system are not the people who are using the system. And so you have to look more systemically. Look at the makeup of your team. How diverse is the makeup of your team? I would assume, having been uh, a, an electrical engineer myself, um, that it's probably not particularly representative from a gender or race perspective. So look at the team that you have. How are you working to make your team more representative um, and therefore address some of the biases that are going to be put in place by having um, a non-representative team building out the systems. So there's a bunch of things in there, but I guess in summary, um, build for the end user in mind, make it human-centered, make it easy to use, appropriate um, and intuitive. Design with the understanding that you work within a system and make sure that you don't have unintended consequences and that you're always feeding back to understand what the impact on the what br broader system is. Um, and ensure that you think about the, the biases that are going to be inherent in the fact that the people building the system are not necessarily the people using the system. Thank you very much, Ms. Devi. And now moving on to Professor Gupta. So based on your background in advising the Health Minister of India and in drafting national policies, how can governments play a pivotal role in addressing the intersection of health equity and the digital divide, particularly in the context of healthcare access for marginalized communities, and also what policy measures should be prioritized to ensure equitable digital health access? Thank you, Connie. Uh, this depends on the uh, economic status of the country. So you know, when you have a LMIC country like India, so I'll give you example was what was done. So we understand that there is a sizable population which is uh, underprivileged, which is marginalized. So there was a scheme that was launched for 550 million people, you know, and you have to understand that countries are at different phases of development and they require investments on infrastructure, they require investments on health and education, and it's not possible you know, to give the amount that the sectors actually deserve. So what was done very carefully since I was uh, in drafting the health policy, I played a role in that. So we carefully treaded the path of saying, let's first make primary care a comprehensive primary care. So first guarantee primary care. So that's comprehensive, that includes chronic disease management to all the things then let's convert the sub-centers and private centers into health and wellness centers and put telemedicine as a part of it. So what happens is 160,000 health and wellness centers now across the country offer you telemedicine. Then we created an e-Sanjeevni program, which is a telemedicine program, uh, which is you can get a doctor consultation for free. So that is across specialties. That's why it's at 120 million consultations. And now what's going to happen is we're uh, putting in AI and NLP in that. So given that India has 36 states and people talk different languages, their dialects are different. So a person talking from a southern state to a doctor in northern state will hear like his language when he speaks and the doctor will hear in his language when he listens to the patient's problem. So I think India has um, planned its strategy for addressing the vulnerable and the underprivileged sections as it charts its course of development. One is that integrate technology in the care delivery, right from the primary care. So that has proven, as I said, 460 million health records, uh, 550 million people given insurance, uh, which is of a very decent amount, I would say, which a typically middle class would you know, afford. So on the policy side, on digital health, India has, as of as we speak, is probably uh, the largest implementation of digital health in the country that is happening. And I would bring here one point that the government has not only to take the stewardship, 
but also the ownership of investing in digital health. Debbie would understand it very well that digital health is still figuring out the business model. That's why you see the largest companies have withdrawn digital health and as much they can give you know, talks on the forum, but their investments are on futuristic technologies, which are probabilistic technologies. But uh, the companies that forayed into it years ago don't exist on the map. So I think governments have to play a frontal role on investing like Indian government has done. They set up a national digital health mission, rolling it across states, ensuring that everyone has what you call the Ayushman Bharat Health Account number, ABHA number. And you know, we actually will be probably the first country to work towards what I have championed is that let's work to make digital health for all by 2028. And this for those who work in healthcare and more so in public health. Uh, 45 years back in Alma Ata, we promised health for all by 2000. It's 23 years after the deadline that we are still not close to that. At least we can try, you know, champion digital health for all by 2028. If that is one objective we pursue as governments across the world, I think a uh, lot of issues will get addressed because there is a whole lot of planning that will go into doing that. And it's doable. That's the only way you can address the issue of health equity because the practical part is that doctors who study in urban areas do not want to go to rural areas. They will not. I mean, even if you push them to do, they will find a way to scuttle that. But the only way you can do is you can get technology there into their hands through the mobile phones. I think now the systems are fairly advanced. Tomorrow we are hosting a session on generate uh, the, the, the conversational AI in low resource setting. So you can have chatbots interacting with people, addressing their basic problems. And 80% of the problems are routine, acute problems. So I think we need to leverage technology, not only as a policy, but as a program. And there are best practices available. I think India has, parts of Africa have, but these are like islands of excellence. I think forums like these are good to discuss if they can be mainstreamed into islands of excellence to center of excellence, then we can, you know, replicate them and scale those programs. So I think uh, India probably would have a good story as we speak about uh, scale up of digital health program. But again, the key point is that the federal government has to be the funder for the program. And where do you start as health helpline? If you really want to address the inequities, start a health helpline, which people can, you know, pick the phone, talk to a doctor or a paramedic and get a consultation free of cost, get into projects like e Sanjeevni, which I think the country is offering to other countries as a goodwill gesture, is where you connect to district hospitals and tell doctors to allocate time for doing digital consultations. So these programs actually help you bridge the digital divide and health and wellness centers, a phenomenal experience of under 60,000 uh, health and wellness centers which have telemedicine facility. So I think picking up the queue, I would say it's time for implementation. For policy-wise, I think we all know that I think Debbie very clearly said it's getting integrated. In fact, I go a further line and say, if you are not into digital health, you are not into healthcare. Don't talk healthcare. That's the truth, actually. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Gupta. And finally, to Jerry, drawing from your experiences in speaking about youth in cyberspace and internet governance, how can young advocates actively participate in shaping internet governance policies to ensure that digital health resources are accessible and equitable for all, regardless of social economic status or geographic location? And also, what are some ex successful examples of youth-driven initiatives in this context? Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, well, in the realm of youth in cyberspace and intern gov governance, empowering young advocates to actively shape inner governance policies is crucial for ensuring equitable access to digital health resources. So young advocates can play a transformative role in policy discussions by engaging in many ways, <clears throat> such as, for example, participating in the IGF because uh, with this active participation, we start to break the ice in how to discuss, how to um, have dialogues, how to ask questions and all of these uh, um, activities, even though they are seen as very daily for experienced people, for youth, for youth, this is um, yeah ways to break the ice and to gain confidence in how to um, participate in public debates. And they also get insights into current challenges and opportunities in digital health and governance. 
Second, for a formation of youth coalitions, a young advocates can form coalitions or networks dedicated to digital health equity. And these coalitions can amplify the, co the collective voice of young people advocating for policies that prioritize accessibility and inclusivity in digital health. For example, we have a, the Internet Society youth, a, a youth Group, or we have a regionally a different youth initiatives. And a chapter about digital uh, health could also be open so that uh, coalitions in this specific topic can uh, deepen into these kind of topics. Also, a uh, third, it would be engagement with multi-stakeholder processes. <clears throat> so not just the IGF, but also um, in other kind of processes uh, that are led by governments, NGO or industry stakeholders. And their participation ensures that diverse voices contribute to shaping policies that consider the needs of all. And um, it is also important that in this circumstance, so public sector and industries and NGOs can also open this kind of opportunity for youth and that they um, actively seek for youth that could participate into their processes as well. Because uh, if they don't do it uh, in such a direct uh, way, so youth, as I before, uh, as I mentioned before, they could feel intimidated and think that they are not um, experienced enough to participate. Uh, the fourth, youth lead policy research. Uh, young advocates can initiate research projects to understand the specific challenges faced by marginalized communities in, assess in accessing digital health resources. Um, because evidence-based research can be a powerful tool for advocating targeted policy changes. And I think this is something that it is, uh, it is a situation, it is a possibility in many countries that, uh, that have the resources for research, but it is still very, uh, is still very behind in countries, for example, in Latin America, where we don't have uh, so much uh, support from public um, foundations or from the government to do research. And we also do not have like so big research um, focus in our university. So I think um, maybe one professor can, can bring this kind of, of perspective that can inspire uh, the students to make um, a research group, for example, universities in Brazil, they have like um, a student groups in which they um, meet some day of the week or some uh, day monthly and they discuss a specific um, topics. So I think this is a good practice so that youth can um, start to create, th that they can start to discuss and that they can start to bring this to university and to other uh, colleagues and classmates. Um, of course, it would be great if some uh, countries could also start to, um, to help other global South countries in order that they can have more research and that the, that, that the students can participate more in these kind of uh, initiatives in their own countries. Um, also innovation hubs for digital health. So um, for example, in which uh, hubs in which um, young innovators, healthcare professionals, and policymakers can create um, solutions together. In this sense, uh, it would be also uh, good to have a funding from an organization or a company that can also collaborate so that uh, these kinds of innovations at the end can also maybe have like um, starting a um, amount of financial resources so that they, that they can start with this kind of innovation and that a uh, youth can feel that they are able to become um, uh, innovators in this kind of field. Um, but also I think that this kind of innovation address gaps in digital health accessibility. And some kind of examples of youth driven initiatives um, are for example, digital health task forces because in several regions, youth-led task forces focus on creating policy recommendations for integrating digital health into broader internal governance frameworks. <clears throat> uh, also, youth-led data privacy campaigns um, in which youth can also, um, for example, create dialogues in their communities and they can um, make provide awareness about 
the importance of robust data privacy me measures in digital health technologies that people uh, and common patients can also understand why it is important to protect their privacy when they go to um, when they access some kind of digital uh, health tool and a uh, global youth hackathons for health in which um, there are health challenges that can develop on innovative apps and platform addressing specific healthcare needs that are um, yeah, specifically related in the communities of these youth. And I also consider um, another action. It's um, this movement also of paid internships that um, students can also uh, have access to internships uh, that are paid so that they can equally participate um, in a practical application of what they are learning at university or what they are um, are studying. So, um, well, I think that by actively participating in these initiatives, young active young advocates contribute with fresh perspectives, innovative solutions, and commitment to digital health equity in in internet governance policies because they are digital natives and they um, also could understand. Um, I consider they could understand uh, rapidly uh, how the how the technologies can help them, but also their challenges, their issues, and they can also um, become more active as they are not just the future, but also the present. So thank you. Thank you very much, Jerry, and also thank you once again to the panel for their responses. And so now we'll move on to the Q&A session. So if any on-site participants would like to raise their questions, please feel free to walk up to the mic. Hello, I'm Nicole. I'm a year two student in Hong Kong. In case of another pandemic like COVID-19 nowadays, uh, how do you think the current digital health can be developed and improved and contribute to the society in recovering and ensuring each individual can receive the accurate and same medical advice and treatment without physically visiting a healthcare facilities as it will be crowded with a lot of people or elderly? Thank you. Um, thanks. I think actually looking at some of the work that was done during COVID-19 is a really good example of um, how we can use digital health to address issues that, that come up during a pandemic. Um, I think one of the things that has really been a challenge in the work that we do is that we speak directly to citizens and empower them in their own health. Given that the medical fraternity is quite patriarchal, that's not usually a priority. And so what we found is that when an issue is something that happens to somebody else, then there isn't, it isn't seen as a need to provide people with the right information. But when COVID-19 happened, Everybody was affected. Nobody had the information. Um, it didn't matter if you were the president of the, of the country or if you were a student at a high school. No one had the information about the pandemic that was needed. And so we were able to use really large scale networks, um, things that were already there like Facebook, like WhatsApp, like SMS platforms to be able to get information to people extremely quickly. And in a time when the information was changing on on a daily basis. This wasn't something where you could um, take a lot of time, think through things, and put up a website, and think about how things are going to be talked about. This was happening in real time. So you continually had to be updating things. People continually had to get the latest information. Um, and without that, um, many people, many more people would have died um, than did already in the pandemic. I think what's important, though, is for us not to forget the lessons of COVID-19. Um, we very quickly forget as human beings um, when, uh, <laughs> when things go back to so-called normal. Um, we very quickly forget the lessons that we learned. And so I think one of the really important things that needs to come, that needs to 
continue from COVID-19 is an understanding that knowledge is power in the, pati in the patient or, or citizen's hands, um, and this isn't something that needs to be hoarded by the medical fraternity, that by giving information to people at a really large scale, you can improve their health, and you actually make your life easier at a time when you are most needed. Uh, digital health can't replace a healthcare professional, but it certainly can reduce the burden for healthcare professionals. Um, and so that's a really important thing that we need to continue to, to consider as we move on from COVID-19. I think the other thing to remember is that um, we built up platforms, digital health platforms, that um, solved problems during COVID-19. Screening for symptoms, for example, gathering data that could be used for decision making, sending out large scale pieces of information to people. Many, many people in the digital health space reacted very quickly and created incredible platforms that could be used to solve the problems during COVID-19. Many of those no longer exist today. Um, and so we need to remember that there needs to be an investment in digital health infrastructure in the long term so that we don't have to spin up new solutions every time there is a new pandemic because there will be another one. Um, it's not something that um, is going anywhere. So how are we preparing so that when the next pandemic comes, we're not having to start from scratch all over again? Um, and I think that's something that we're very quickly uh, have forgotten. So yeah, I'd like to take a minute and address that as well, if, if you don't mind. Um, a, a couple of things, I think, from the pandemic, and that's a really great question because, you know, as, as a society, we want to learn from the past. Um, there's two areas where I think uh, are worthy to bring forward from the pandemic. Uh, first is that there is an incredible value in these uh, cross-sector partnerships. So in public, private, and academic partnerships. We saw a lot of that during the pandemic, literally to light up research on understanding the virus, to do things like uh, drug discovery. Um, some of this was governance sponsored uh, consortium, other uh, were uh, more uh, privately funded consortium. Um, and then the third class was kind of just similar groups of people coming together, um, what I would say almost community driven groups. So really this, um, cross-sector collaboration, that's the first thing. Second thing is there is some um, uh, good standards work that I think was done during the pandemic that could be brought forward. Um, so we saw the advent of something called smart health cards um, during the pandemic. Uh, smart health cards are a digital representation of a relevant clinical information. Uh, during the pandemic, it was um, used to represent uh, vaccine status. Um, so think of it as um, a vac information about your vaccine status encoded in a QR code. Um, there has been an extension of that, uh, something called smart health links, where you can encode um, uh, a link to a, a source that would have a minimum set of clinical information. Um, and it's it's literally in, encoded in a QR code that can be put on a mobile device or printed on a card for somebody to take if they don't have access to a mobile device. Um, a smart, heart, a smart health cards also um, reinforces um, the concept of some of the work being done by the IPS or International Patient Summary Group. It is a, um, a group that is trying to drive a standard around representing a minimal set of clinical information that could be used in emergency services. And so some of those things that happened in the standards bodies, I think are, are were very powerful during uh, the, the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, I would love to see more momentum around driving those use cases forward and also um, expanding them. Thank you. Thanks. Firstly, another COVID shouldn't happen. That's first. Uh, second, I don't think that, you know, um, technology at any time fail. Actually, it proved that it was ready. So whether you looked at uh, the fast track development of vaccine, which was collaborating researchers across the globe over technology, uh, repurposed drug used artificial intelligence. That's why we did it. Uh, I think almost every country, our country used COVID app. We delivered 2.2 billion vaccinations totally digital. So I think digital health proved that it was ready. It is ready. Uh, challenges will come, but I think technology is the only one that saved the lives. We wouldn't be sitting in this room, trust me, if technology wasn't around. The only thing that we should do through forums like this is to keep the momentum going. What we want is to 
forget the moment no covid and you know go back to the old ways i think there were uh, incentives given by the government there were flexibilities offered in terms of continuing the telehealth regulations like in united states i think that should become permanent that's all we should do so technology is already proved that it's ready uh, we were waiting for a covid to be you know shaken and start using it so i think technology is ready will always be ready with us uh, for anything that comes our way thank you Jerry, would you like to provide a response? Yeah, um, I, I just wanted to say that um, I consider that in this situation of a pandemic, um, telemedicine and also uh, the implementation of robots, as the case, as the case that I mentioned previously, um, are a very, um, of a huge importance and could also be very useful, taking into consideration that uh, it's very dangerous for humans to attend uh, or to take care of people because of the um, contagious uh, possibilities or risks. So I think that in these specific scenarios, uh, the application of um, telemedicine and robots is particularly useful. Of course, taking into, into consideration that it's an emergency, that the robots should not be working um, alone. They should also be um, guided by humans, but at least they are protecting also that uh, workers such as nurses that are commonly a uh, workforce that is uh, not so valued in different uh, societies because this the because the tasks that nurses do, for example, are normally considered as dirty or not um, uh, not of a great importance. So I think actually these kind of technologies can uh, protect not just the um, the health of the patients that are infected by COVID or other uh, pandemic, but also the work of the medical um, professionals such as nurses that are normally very exposed. And in the other side, I also remember the initiative of, of open science it, that my country Costa Rica actually um, had proposed to the World Health Organization so that uh, the initiatives, the projects, and the research that was done in a context of a pandemic um, is opened and that, and that also is kept um, uh, available for every person that's interested. And the data can also be accessed uh, without having to pay, without having to uh, make a patent of that. And I consider this also of extremely importance because in a case of an emergency, eh, we just don't have time for that. And we should really try to cooperate within each other and to try to, um, yeah, to, to respond to the emergency in a holistic and collaborative way. Thank you. Thank you very much to the panel for your responses. Are there any other on-site questions? If not, then I'll take the question from the chat. So what are some emerging trends and future directions in digital health literacy? And what do you suggest to individuals to stay informed and up to date in this rapidly evolving field and ensuring they have the accurate guidance and, out, and in date, outdated information? I'll take that uh, because of the couple of initiatives we are learning. So one is on the uh, technical community side, what we are doing is within the health parliament that I run with my team, we have created collabs. We are creating developers for health, working with companies like Google and others, because I think what we need to do is to create developers to solve problems. So that's one initiative where people who are enthusiastic about being part of the technical contributors to digital transformation of health, that's one. The other thing, in next uh, three months, we'll be starting courses for class eight students on robotics and artificial intelligence, an elementary course. We want to educate them very early on so that you know they can choose what they want to do. They will be aware on what the opportunities are. And same way, you know, we are doing courses which are very elementary level for people to understand rather than going to deep dive into tech. So, and everyone who is into health, I would strongly recommend that if you don't know digital health, you will hit a zone of professional irrelevance. Please update whatever you do, whether you do a one week course, two week course, just make sure that you know digital health from an ecosystem perspective. Thank you.
Would any other speaker like to take the question? Yeah, I just I just a few comments on that. Um, I, I think it's a I think it's always a challenge uh, at the pace of innovation that we're seeing today to keep current. Um, so I want to call out and acknowledge um, um, our panel here today and the people who put the panel together today and gave us this opportunity. This is one way that the dialogue starts and that information is shared. And so um, more opportunities for people of um, similar interests to come together, I think, is um, will always help advance. Um, uh, you know, this, the, the state of where we're at from an understanding perspective. So, so opportunities like this, um, you know, training um, as well. Um, I know, and it's not just training from tech providers, it is just training infused into the academic system as well. And so I, I would agree with what Dr. Gupta, Gupta said there. But again, a call out to the folks who put together this panel, because I think this is one way that that, uh, that, that starts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Geraldine. So we have about five minutes left, so maybe we could go with the closing remarks from each of the speakers. Maybe starting with Ms. Debbie. Um, I guess my closing remark would be that um, technology is a great enabler. Um, it can actually be used to decrease the inequity that we see in health, but also um, in digital literacy. Um, I am actually very positive about the future <laughs> um, that, um, that we see with digital health, and I think Dr. Gupta is right, the technology is ready. Um, we've seen many case studies where things have been done at a really large scale. This is no longer a fledgling area. Um, this is now a mature and um, really large scale um, uh, area of practice. And so I'm really excited to see what happens from this point. Um, and I'm excited to see um, that we have youth involved in this panel because, yes, absolutely, um, youth will be the people who will be building the next um, evolution in this space. So really excited to see how that works and to see um, how things evolve from here. I think I would say that in this age where patients are more informed, if not, you know, uh, than anyone about health conditions, about the treatment options. It is high time doctors know them before patients start telling them, you don't know about it, let me tell you this, I saw this. So I think uh, one this is that digital health is something that everyone who's into healthcare, whether it's a clinician or a paramedic needs to learn this. Second, if you're talking of digital health, uh, scalability, scalability comes first. So I think upskill, continuously upskill, cross-skill yourself. And lastly, I must say thanks, Connie, for putting up this wonderful panel discussion. Ms. Sherilyn? Yeah, for, first off, um, I want to start by expressing my gratitude for uh, being included in this. It, it was a wonderful opportunity. I want to echo the sentiment that um, uh, youth play a, a huge role in this going forward, and um, I'm very appreciative that um, that you you brought everybody together um, under this umbrella. The thing from a tech perspective, I, I agree with the panelists um, on that. You know, digital health is is here now. Um, the one part that I would add to this is that um, when we're thinking about things new, evolving technology like um, generative AI, um, let's do this in responsible in a responsible way, open the dialogue around policy discussion. Um, a, a discussion is always healthy and let's, let's make sure that this technology that we're bringing to light um, with good intent benefits everyone. Thanks. Well, and in my case, uh, well, in conclusion, um, yeah, let us strive to be digital health leaders equipped not only with technical skills, but also with a profound commitment to equity. Um, I consider value the work of nurses is very important, uh, even though the technology, the technology um, evolves, uh, of course, professionals, humans will be very necessary. And it is a, a fact that technology can help us to protect them. Uh, and also the patients in situations of emergency and also value um, a value of the work of ethicists uh, in when they have something to say that they are not um, misvalued that they can take into consideration and also when there are conflicts um, 
uh, with, for example, a profit, so that ethicists can also have a uh, opinion of that, and that, and that they can also try to uh, contribute in the mission of responsible AI, uh, so that they are not just there uh, as a decoration, but they are actually taken into consideration. Um, and also, uh, well, of course, the role of youth is fundamental, um, as we see. Um, all the youth-led initiatives that could um, strengthen the mission of digital health literacy nowadays can in the future so developed in a in a very good environment that it's uh, inclusive that it's included in marg marginalized communities and uh, all the population so I consider that uh, now healthcare and digital healthcare is should not be more a privilege, but also a right. And uh, yes, and I'm very thankful also for the opportunity to be here and to uh, express um, yeah, my opinions and to talk about uh, youth as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much once again to the panel for your insightful responses and the workshop has closed today. Thank you very much for coming and um, Together, we hope we can create a future where digital health resources are accessible, equitable, and can empower individuals to navigate their health journey confidently online. Thank you.